Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you're all very welcome this evening. And as Olivia has just said, uh, you're among the elite. It's the first time there's ever been a 2,000 elite in the country. But uh, there are so many people outside that I think you've got to consider yourselves among that, that elite. Trinity is absolutely delighted to be co-sponsoring this event with Amnesty International. Amnesty is, 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 is an organization that relates very much to intellectuals, academics, to the student, student community, and it's something we're particularly delighted to do. It's also part of our commitment to promoting, if you like, public debate on contemporary issues in Ireland. There's been a long tradition of this in Trinity, and the Policy Institute, where I'm director, is one of the institutions within the college that's very active in, um, in promoting this tradition. And I have to say, we're very successful in getting good audiences for our debates and seminars, but we've never quite had this number before. Um, and you'll have read, of course, that there, there, there was a suggestion at the weekend in the newspaper that um, we should have actually picked Crow Park for this venue, given the huge demand for space. And I, I, probably we should have, because we didn't know that during this week it was going to change and be, adopt a much more liberal ethos. So maybe next, next time round. <laughs> Professor Chomsky's, Chomsky's next visit to Ireland. Um, sorry, just have a few notes here that I put in the wrong order. Um, we are, of course, very privileged that Professor Chomsky has agreed to speak to us this evening. And that old cliche, you know, the one that goes, this evening's speaker needs no introduction, really works in the case of Professor Chomsky. He's widely described as having one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. And in anybody's language, and Professor Chomsky knows quite a bit about language, that's quite a compliment. Reading about him over the last week when I was asked by the college to do this introduction, um, I read quite widely about him. I'd read him before, but not about him in the same way. I came to the conclusion that his status in society, the fact that he's so well known, uh, and is so well known across such a wide range of, of, of intellectual disciplines, comes from his ability to document complex contemporary issues very thoroughly, and at the same time set them in, in, in a larger context. Um, this is something which we economists describe as being able to put the micro and the macro together, and it's really only very great thinkers who have the ability to do that, and Professor Chomsky is one such thinker. Since he's somebody who's very strong on facts, and those of you who read his work will know that, let me just give you a few Chomsky facts. If you want more, you can Google them, but I warn you, you'll get over 5 million Googles, and even if you put them in parentheses, you'll get 4.4 million Googles. So it's, not a, it's, a, it's a big number to go through, but there is an excellent web page, homepage for him, which, which um, uh, is, 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 is very accessible. He was born in 1928 and has been at MIT since 1955. He's honorary degrees from over 20 universities, and, of course, one of the things that's striking about that list of universities is how widely diverse they are. They're not just simply in one part of the world, in one type, in one type of country. They're very, they're very widely spread. He's obviously published a, wi a wide range of books and papers, and I suppose one of the interesting things for us as academics is that he manages to move seamlessly between the sort of discourse of, of, of academia and the discourse of, of, of the pop population at large. Um, he has, has, is, is, is a uh, fellow of both the American Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Science, and that's not something that's terribly usual. He's also the recipient of a large number of, 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 of prizes and honors. Professor Chomsky is very familiar with controversy over the decades, and in fact, he continues to be, as readers of The Guardian in the last week will be very aware, and in fact, he's responded publicly to The Guardian, and some of the issues raised there, I think, will come up in this evening's lecture. The title for the lecture this year is War on Terror. And those of you who were at last year's lecture will know that it was also War on Terror. And of course, that's not because we're dull and boring people that we don't think of new titles, but rather that this, in a sense, this War on Terror is one of the, um, if you like, driving themes of the, of, the, of the times in which we live. Last year's lecture given by Michael Ignatia from Harvard was very memorable. And those of you who attended it will remember there was a lot of robust debate and dialogue with very strong comments coming from the floor. Uh, and I'm sure after tonight's lecture, we'll have a similar response. Let me just finish off by noting that Ed, Edmund Burke, who was one of Trinity College's most famous alumni, particularly when we're thinking about the world of public debate and also of free speech, has a quotation which I think is very apropos. He says, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Some of you in the audience may agree, may disagree with Professor Chomsky, but nobody could deny that he isn't somebody who could ever be described as having as doing nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, let me hand you over to Professor Chomsky. Uh, 
The word uh, terror is one that uh, rightly arouses strong emotions and deep concerns. The primary concern, naturally, should be to take measures to alleviate the threat. Uh, it has been severe in the past, and it's likely that it will be even more so in the future. Uh, to proceed with this in some serious way, uh, we should have establish a few guidelines. Uh, here are several simple ones. Uh, the first is that facts matter, uh, even if we don't happen to like them. Uh, the second is that uh, elementary moral principles matter, uh, even if they have consequences that we would prefer not to face. And the third is that relative clarity matters. So it's pointless to uh, uh, seek uh, a truly precise definition of terror, or for that matter of any other concept outside of the hard sciences and mathematics, and often not even there. Uh, but we should seek enough clarity, uh, at least, to be able to distinguish terror from two notions that lie uneasily at its borders, uh, aggression at one end and uh, legitimate resistance at the other. Terror finds its place somewhere between those two. Uh, well, if we accept these guidelines, there are actually quite constructive ways to deal with the problem of terrorism, uh, which are, again, quite severe. Uh, it's commonly claimed that uh, critics of ongoing policies do not present solutions. If you check the record, I think you'll find something else. Uh, you'll find that there's an accurate translation of that charge, and namely they do present solutions, uh, very constructive ones, but I don't like them. Uh, so therefore, they don't present solutions. Uh, suppose then that we accept these simple guidelines and now turn to the war on terror. Well, since we've agreed that facts matter, uh, it matters that the war on terror uh, was not declared by George W. Bush on 9-11, but by the Reagan administration uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, they came into office declaring that their foreign policy would confront what the president called the evil scourge of terrorism, a plague spread by depraved opponents of civilization itself in a return to barbarism in the modern age. It's the Secretary of State. Uh, the campaign was uh, directed against uh, a particularly vi virulent form of the plague, uh, state-directed international terrorism. Uh, the main focus of the war on terror was Central America and the Middle East, uh, but it reached uh, Southern Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and beyond. Uh, a second fact is that the war was declared and implemented by pretty much the same people who are conducting the redeclared war on terrorism. The civilian component of the redeclared war on terror is led by John Negroponte, who was appointed last year to supervise all counter-terror operations. I'll return to some of his tasks during the first phase of the war. The military component of the redeclared war on terror is led by Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, during the first phase of the war on terror, Rumsfeld was uh, Reagan, President Reagan's special representative to the Middle East, and there his main task was to establish close relations with Saddam Hussein so that the United States could provide him with large-scale aid, including means to develop weapons of mass destruction, uh, all of this continuing long after the huge atrocities against the Kurds and after the end of the war with Iran. Uh, the official purpose of the continuing aid was not concealed. Uh, it was, as President Bush number one put it, it was Washington's responsibility to aid American exporters and also, I'm quoting now, the strikingly unanimous view of Washington and its allies, Britain and Saudi Arabia, that whatever the sins of the Iraqi leader, he offered the West and the region a better hope for his country's stability 
than did those who have suffered his repression. Now, that's the New York Times Middle East correspondent describing Washington's judgment as George Bush, number one, uh, authorized Saddam to crush the Shiite rebellion in 1991, which probably would have overthrown the tyrant, uh, in this case leaving tens of thousands of corpses. Uh, Saddam is at last on trial for his crimes. The first trial, which is now underway, is for crimes that he committed in 1982. Uh, 1982 happens to be an important year in U.S.-Iraq relations. It was in 1982 that Reagan removed Iraq from the list of states supporting terror. Uh, The reason was so that aid could flow to his friend in Baghdad. Uh, Rumsfeld then visited Baghdad to confirm the arrangements. Uh, Judging by uh, media and journals of opinion, it would be impolite to mention any of these facts, so I beg your pardon, Uh, let alone to suggest that some others might be standing alongside Saddam before the bar of justice. Uh, Removing uh, Iraq, Saddam, from the list of states supporting terrorism left a gap. Uh, That gap was at once filled by Cuba, uh, perhaps in recognition of the fact that the U.S. terrorist wars against Cuba from 1961 had just peaked at that time, including events that would be on the front pages right now in societies that valued their freedom. I'll return briefly to some of them. Uh, Since the first war on terror was waged by those who are now carrying out the redeclared war or their immediate mentors, it follows that anyone who's seriously interested in the redeclared war on terror uh, should ask at once how it was carried out in the 1980s. Uh, That topic, however, is under a virtual ban, and that becomes understandable as soon as we investigate the facts. Uh, The first war on terror very quickly became a murderous and brutal terrorist war in every corner of the world where it reached, uh, leaving traumatized societies that may never recover. Uh, What happened is hardly obscure, but it's doctrinally unacceptable, and therefore it's protected from inspection. Uh, Unearthing the record, which is not very difficult, is an enlightening exercise uh, with enormous implications for the future. Well, these are a few of the relevant facts. Uh, Let's turn to the second of the guidelines, uh, elementary moral principles. Uh, The most elementary, so elementary that I'm embarrassed to mention it, is a virtual truism. Uh, Decent people apply to themselves the same standards that they apply to others, in fact, more stringent ones. Uh, Adherence to this principle of universality would have many useful consequences. Uh, For one thing, it would save a lot of forests. The principle would radically reduce published reports and commentary on social and political affairs. It would virtually eliminate the newly fashionable discipline of just war theory. It would wipe the the slate almost clean with regard to the war on terror. Uh, And the reason is the same in all cases, many others, too. The principle of universality is rejected, uh, for the most part, tacitly, sometimes explicitly. Uh, These are very sweeping statements, and I'm purposely putting them in a stark form uh, to invite you to challenge them, and I hope that you do so. Uh, You'll find, I think, that although the statements are very slightly overdrawn on purpose, Uh, they nevertheless are uncomfortably true to, close to accurate, and in fact very fully documented. But try for yourselves and see. Actually, here's another one you might try uh, from the front pages, in England at least. Uh, In England, uh, the principle of universality would terminate uh, virtually all media and publishers in England under Tony Blair's proposed Uh, Glorification of Terror Act, uh, which actually was voted down by the Lords, uh, who proposed instead a ban on indirect encouragement of terror. Uh, Well, uh, that, uh, I repeat, that 
a law which will be passed in one or another form will shut down uh, virtually every publisher and uh, uh, journal in England. Uh, does this statement sound extreme? Uh, well, not if facts matter. Uh, if they do, then the statement is in fact quite conservative and therefore regarded as outrageous by the educated classes. Uh, 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 and uh, the two proposals would have rather similar consequences. Again, I urge you just to think it through and look at the facts. Uh, this uh, most elementary of moral truisms is sometimes uh, upheld, uh, at least in words. Uh, one example of critical importance today is the Nuremberg Tribunal, which sentenced uh, Nazi criminals. Uh, in sentencing them to death, the uh, Justice Robert, Robert Jackson, who was the chief of counsel for the prosecution uh, for, the, for the United States uh, and the tribunal, uh, he spoke uh, eloquently and memorably on the principle of universality. 1945, here's what he said. If certain acts of violation of treaties are crimes, they are crimes whether the United States does them or whether Germany does them. And we are not prepared to lay down a rule of criminal conduct against others, which we would not be willing to have invoked against us. We must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow. To pass these defendants a poison chalice is to put it to our own lips as well. That's a clear and honorable statement of the principle of universality. Uh, but the judgment at Nuremberg, which had just concluded, crucially violated that principle, consciously and explicitly. The tribunal had the task of defining war crime and crimes against humanity. Uh, it crafted these definitions very carefully so that crimes uh, are criminal uh, only if they were not committed by the Allies. Uh, so urban uh, bombing of civilian concentrations uh, was excluded from the tribunal because the Allies carried it out uh, more barbarically than the Nazis. And uh, Nazi war criminals like Admiral Dönitz, submarine, head of the submarine fleet, uh, he was able to plead successfully uh, that uh, the, their, his British and U.S. counterparts uh, had uh, uh, carried out the same practices, so therefore he was exonerated of those charges. Uh, the reasoning was outlined by Telford Taylor, he's a distinguished international lawyer and historian, who was Jackson's chief counsel for war crimes. Uh, he explained, in his words, that to punish the foe, especially the vanquished foe, for conduct in which the enforcing nation has engaged would be so grossly inequitable as to discredit the laws themselves. And that's quite correct. But the operative definition of crime uh, also discredits the laws themselves. And subsequent tribunals are discredited by the same moral flaw, uh, but the self-exemption of the powerful from uh, international law and elementary moral principles uh, bars any discussion of these unwelcome truisms. Well, let's turn to the third background issue, the defining terror and distinguishing it from aggression and legitimate resistance. Actually, I've been writing about terror for 25 years, uh, ever since the Reagan administration came into office declaring its war on terror. And I've been using definitions that seem doubly appropriate uh, first of all, they make sense. And secondly, they, they are the official definitions of those who are waging the war. So to take one of these official definitions, uh, terrorism is the calculated use of violence or threat of violence to attain goals that are political, religious, or ideological in nature through intimidation, coercion, or instilling fear, typically targeting civilians. Uh, the British government's definition is about the same. Uh, terrorism is the use or threat of action which is violent, damaging, or disrupting and is intended to influence the government or intimidate the public 
uh, and is for the purpose of advancing a political, religious, or ideological cause. Uh, these definitions seem fairly clear, uh, pretty close to ordinary usage, and there also seems to be general agreement that they are appropriate when discussing the terrorism of enemies. But a problem arises at once. Uh, these definitions yield an entirely unacceptable consequence. It follows that the United States is a leading terrorist state, and the same is true of uh, what's been called the spear carrier for Pax Americana. It's referring to Tony Blair's Britain and Britain's leading journal of international affairs. Uh, this was true dramatically during the Reaganite war on terror. Uh, just to take the most uncontroversial case, uh, Reagan's state directed terrorist war against Nicaragua was condemned by the World Court, backed by two Security Council resolutions, both vetoed by the United States, uh, with Britain uh, politely abstaining. Another completely clear case is Cuba, since 1961, where the record by now is voluminous and not controversial, and there's a long list beyond them. Uh, however, we may ask a question about these terrorist crimes. Uh, we may ask, uh, for example, whether the state-directed terror against Nicaragua was really terrorism or whether it rises to the level of the much higher crime of aggression. Uh, the concept of aggression was defined clearly enough by Justice Jackson at Nuremberg in terms that were basically reiterated by uh, in an authoritative General Assembly resolution with no objections. Uh, an aggressor, Jackson proposed to the tribunal, is a state that is the first to commit such actions as invasion of its armed forces with or without a declaration of war of the territory of another state, or provision of support to armed bands formed in the territory of another state, or refusal notwithstanding the request of the invaded state to take in its own territory all the measures in its power to deprive those bands of all assistance or protection. Well, the first of those provisions unambiguously applies to the U.S.-British invasion of Iraq, and the second, just as clearly, applies to the U.S. war against Nicaragua, uh, which means that the Nuremberg judgment is appropriate. Uh, however, we might give the current incumbents in Washington and their uh, European allies uh, the benefit of the doubt, uh, considering them guilty only of the lesser crime of international terrorism on a huge and unprecedented scale. Uh, the World Court, uh, interestingly, did not condemn the Reagan administration for aggression in the Nicaragua case. And the reasons are instructive and of quite considerable contemporary relevance. Uh, Nicaragua's case at the World Court was presented by the distinguished Harvard University law professor, uh, Abram Chase, former legal advisor to the State Department. Uh, the court, however, rejected a large part of his case uh, on the grounds that when the United States accepted the jurisdiction of the World Court in 1946, uh, it did so only after entering a reservation, excluding itself from prosecution under multilateral treaties, including the UN Charter. Uh, so therefore, it's barred from prosecution for aggression. Uh, the court accepted that and therefore restricted its deliberations to customary international law and a bilateral U.S.-Nicaragua treaty so that the more serious charges were excluded. And even on these very narrow grounds, uh, the court did charge Washington with uh, unlawful use of force, that's in lay language international terrorism, and uh, ordered it to terminate the crimes and pay substantial reparations. Uh, the Reagan administration reacted by escalating the war with bipartisan support uh, after the shattered country fell back under U.S. control it declined to further misery. It's now the second poorest country in Latin America after Haiti, and by accident, also second after Haiti, 
in intensity of U.S. intervention in the past century. Uh, the standard way to lament these tragedies is to say that Haiti and Nicaragua are battered by storms of their own making. I'm quoting the Boston Globe, which is at the liberal extreme of uh, American journalism. Uh, Guatemala ranks third in both misery and U.S. intervention, uh, another one of those curious aberrations that uh, litter history, uh, all placed on the index for obvious reasons. Uh, these uh, considerations have to do with the boundary between terror and aggression. Uh, what about the boundary between terror and resistance, legitimate resistance? Uh, one question that arises is the legitimacy of actions, I'm now quoting, the legitimacy of actions to realize the right to self-determination, freedom, and independence as derived from the Charter of the United Nations of people forcibly deprived of that right, particularly peoples under colonial and racist regimes and foreign occupation. Uh, do such actions fall under terror or resistance? Well, the quoted words are from the most forceful denunciation of the crime of terrorism by the UN General Assembly. That was in December 1987. Uh, it was taken up under Reaganite pressure, hence it's obviously an important resolution. It's even more important because of the near unanimity of support for it. Uh, the resolution passed 153 to 2, uh, with one country, Honduras, abstaining. Uh, the resolution stated that nothing in the present resolution could in any way prejudice the right to self-determination, freedom, and independence, as characterized in the words I just quoted. Well, the two countries that voted against the resolution explained their reasons at the UN session. The reasons were based on the paragraph that I just quoted. The phrase colonial and racist regimes was understood to refer to their ally, apartheid South Africa, uh, which was then consummating its horrendous massacres in the neighboring countries and continuing its brutal repression within. And evidently, the United States and Israel, the two countries that voted against, uh, could not condone resistance to the apartheid regime, uh, particularly when the resistance was led by Nelson Mandela's African National Congress, which is, was one of the world's more notorious terrorist groups, as Washington determined at the same time. Uh, granting legitimacy against foreign occupation was also unacceptable. The phrase was understood to refer to Israel's U.S.-backed military occupation then in its 20th year, and evidently resistance to that occupation could not be condoned either, uh, even though at the time of the resolution, uh, resistance scarcely existed, uh, despite extensive torture, uh, degradation, uh, brutality, robbery of land and resources, and other familiar concomitants of military occupation, uh, Palestinians still remained uh, what they called samidin, uh, those who quietly endure. Uh, well, technically, there are no vetoes at the General Assembly, uh, but in the real world, a negative U.S. vote is a veto. In fact, it's a double veto. The resolution is not implemented, and it's vetoed from reporting and from history, as happened in this case. Uh, it should be added that the voting pattern is quite common at the General Assembly and also at the Security Council on a very wide range of issues. Uh, ever since the mid-1960s, when the world fell pretty much out of control after decolonization, uh, the United States is far in the lead in Security Council vetoes its spear carrier is second, and uh, no one else comes even close. Uh, it's also of some interest to note that a majority of the American public favors abandonment of the veto and following the will of the majority, even if Washington disproves. Well, those are facts virtually unknown in the United States, or I suppose elsewhere. Uh, that suggests another conservative way to deal with the problems of the world, uh, pay attention to public opinion. Uh, terrorism directed or supported by the most powerful states continues to the present, 
often in shocking ways. Uh, these facts offer another useful suggestion as to how to mitigate the plague spread by depraved opponents of civilization itself, namely stop participating in terror and stop supporting it. Uh, that would certainly contribute to the proclaimed objectives. Uh, but that suggestion, too, is off the agenda for the usual reasons. Uh, however, even with careful sanitation of discussion, uh, dilemmas constantly arise. Uh, one has just arisen in the past few weeks uh, when uh, Luis Posada Carriles entered the United States illegally. Uh, even by the narrowest definition of terror, he is clearly one of the most notorious international terrorists from the 1960s to the present. Uh, Venezuela requested that he be extradited to face charges for the bombing of a Cubana airliner in Venezuela, killing 73 people. Now, the charges are admittedly credible, uh, but there's a real difficulty. Uh, after uh, Venezuela, after Pos uh, Posada miraculously escaped from a Venezuelan prison, uh, the liberal Boston Globe reports, he was hired by U.S. Co covered operatives to direct the resupply operation for the Nicaraguan Contras from El Salvador. That is, he was hired to play a prominent role in terrorist atrocities that are incomparably worse than blowing up the Cubana airliner. And therefore, there's a dilemma. To continue quoting the same report, uh, extraditing him for trial would send a worrisome signal to covert foreign agents that they cannot count on unconditional protection from the U.S. government, and it would expose the CIA to embarrassing public disclosures from a former operative. Well, it's clearly a difficult problem. Uh, this is just the past few weeks. Uh, the Posada dilemma was thankfully resolved by the courts, uh, which rejected Venezuela's appeal for his extradition in violation of uh, U.S.-Venezuela extradition treaty. A day later, the head of the FBI, Robert Mueller, urged Europe to speed U.S. demands for extradition. Uh, he said, we are always looking to see how we can make the extradition process go faster. We think we owe it to victims of terrorism to see to it that justice is done efficiently and effectively. Uh, at the uh, Ibero-American Summit, all Latin, heads of Latin American states and Spain, shortly after, the leaders of Spain and the Latin American countries uh, backed Venezuela's efforts to have Posada extradited from the United States to face trial for the Cubana airliner bombing. And they again condemned what they called the blockade of Cuba by the United States uh, in, they were endorsing near unanimous United Nations resolutions, uh, the most recent a few weeks ago with a vote of 179 to four. The four were United States, Israel, uh, Marshall Islands, and Palau. Uh, after strong protests from the U.S. Embassy, the summit withdrew the call for extradition but refused to yield on the demand for an end to economic warfare. Uh, Posada is therefore now free to join his colleague, Orlando Bosch, in Miami. Uh, Bosch is implicated in dozens of terrorist crimes, including the Cubana airliner bombing, and many of these crimes on U.S. soil. Uh, the FBI and the Justice Department wanted him deported as a threat to U.S. national security, but Bush, number one, uh, took care of that by granting him a presidential pardon. Uh, notice that this goes well beyond, both cases, well beyond uh, indirect encouragement of terror, uh, which is to be criminalized in Britain, uh, with consequences uh, that you can deduce. Uh, one consequence would be that every journal or publisher in England uh, is to be banned because of their praise for George Bush, number one, and participation with him in these and other activities. Uh, under the legislation that's proposed by New Labor and the dissenting House of Lords. Uh, one might have thought that a dilemma would have arisen as well 
when John Negroponte was appointed to the position of head of counterterrorism last year. Uh, he was the ambassador to Honduras in the 1980s, where he was running uh, the world's largest CIA station, and not because of the grand role of Honduras in world affairs, uh, but because Honduras was the primary U.S. base for the international terrorist war, which Washington was, for which Washington was condemned by the World Court and the Security Council absent the veto. Uh, Negroponte had the task of ensuring that the international terrorist operations would proceed efficiently. Uh, his responsibilities also included uh, pressuring and bribing senior Honduran generals to step up their support for the terrorist war. The most vicious of the Honduran killers and torturers was General Alvarez Martinez, who was the chief of the Honduran Armed Forces at the time. He had informed the United States that, in his words, he intended to use the Argentine method of eliminating su suspected subversives. No comment necessary on that. Uh, Negroponte uh, regularly denied uh, gruesome state crimes in Honduras to ensure that military aid would continue to flow for international terrorism. Uh, knowing all about Alvarez, the Reagan administration awarded him the Legion of Merit Medal for formal words for encouraging the success of democratic processes in Honduras, which tells you something about democracy promotion. Uh, when the government of Honduras finally got around to trying to deal with these crimes and to bring the perpetrators to justice, the Reagan and Bush number one administration refused to allow Negroponte to testify as the Honduran courts had requested. Uh, coming back to the present, there was virtually no reaction to the appointment of a leading international terrorist to the top counterterrorism position in the world uh, nor was there any reaction to the fact that at the very same time, the heroine of the popular struggle that overthrew the vicious Somoza regime in Nicaragua, uh, Dora Maria Teles, uh, was denied a visa to teach at the Harvard Divinity School on the grounds that she was a terrorist. Uh, her crime was that she had helped overthrow a U.S.-backed tyrant and mass murderer, uh, Orwell, I think, would not have known whether to laugh or to weep. Now, that's today. Uh, so far, I've been keeping to the kinds of topics that would be addressed in a discussion of the war on terror uh, that was not deformed in accord with the iron laws of doctrine. And this barely scratches the surface. But let's now adopt Western hypocrisy and cynicism and keep to the operative definition of terror, which is the same as the official definition, but with the Nuremberg exception. Admissible terror is your terror. Uh, ours is exempt. Uh, even with this constraint, uh, terror is a major problem, undoubtedly. And to mitigate or terminate the threat of, should be a high priority. Uh, regrettably, it is not. Uh, the invasion of Iraq is perhaps the most glaring example of the low priority assigned by U.S. and British leaders to the threat of terror. Uh, they had been advised by their own intelligence agencies and others that the invasion was likely to increase the threat of terror. And indeed, it did, as the same intelligence agencies confirm. To take just one of many illustrations, uh, last May, the CIA reported that Iraq has become a magnet for Islamic militants, similar to Soviet-occupied Afghanistan two, days ago, two decades ago and Bosnia in the 1990s. The CIA concluded that Iraq may prove to be an even more effective training ground for Islamic extremists than Afghanistan was in al-Qaeda's early years because it is serving as a real-world laboratory for urban combat. Uh, shortly after the London bombing last July, uh, Chatham House released a study concluding, in their words, there is no doubt that the invasion of Iraq has given a boost to the al-Qaeda network in propaganda, recruitment, and fundraising while providing an ideal training ground for terrorists 
and leaves the UK, the United Kingdom, at particular risk because it is the closest ally of the United States and is a pillion passenger of American policy in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, riding behind the driver of the motorcycle. Uh, and in fact, uh, terrorist crimes sharply escalated in the following year, approximately tripled. Uh, well, there's extensive supporting evidence to show that, as anticipated, the invasion increased the risk of terror and nuclear proliferation. Uh, none of that shows that planners prefer these consequences, of course. Uh, rather, they're not of much concern in comparison with much higher priorities, uh, priorities that are obscure uh, only to those who prefer what uh, human rights researchers sometimes call intentional ignorance, a widely distributed plague among the educated. Uh, once again, uh, we find uh, very easily a way to reduce the threat of terror. Stop acting in ways that predictably enhance the threat. Uh, well, the enhancement of the threat of terror and proliferation uh, was anticipated in the invasion of Iraq. The invasion uh, actually did so even in unanticipated ways. It's common to say that uh, no weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq after an exhaustive search. However, that's not quite accurate. Uh, there were stores of weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq, uh, namely those that were produced in the 1980s uh, thanks to aid provided by the United States and Britain, along with others. Uh, these sites had been secured by UN inspectors who were in fact dismantling the weapons but the inspectors were dismissed by the invaders and the sites were left unguarded. Uh, the inspectors nevertheless continued to carry out their work with satellite imagery. Uh, they discovered sophisticated massive looting of these installations in over 100 sites. That includes weapons, includes equipment for producing solid and liquid propellant missiles, uh, biotoxins and other materials usable for chemical and biological weapons, and also high precision equipment capable of making parts for nuclear and chemical weapons and missiles. Uh, a Jordanian journalist who was monitoring the Jordanian-Iraqi border found that after the US-UK forces took over, radioactive materials were detected in one out of every eight trucks crossing to Jordan destination unknown, and we'd rather not guess. Uh, well, the ironies are almost inescapable, inexpressible. Uh, the official justification for the US-UK invasion was to prevent the use of weapons of mass destruction that did not exist. The invasion provided the terrorists who had been mobilized by the US and its allies with the means to develop weapons of mass destruction namely equipment that they had provided to Saddam Hussein, caring nothing about the terrible crimes that were later invoked to whip up support for the invasion. Uh, it's as if uh, Iran were now making nuclear weapons using fissionable material provided by the U.S. Uh, to Iran under the Shah, uh, which may indeed be happening. Uh, all of these would be headlines and bold face in every newspaper in a free country in the world uh, that's concerned with the truth of the important truths. You can judge how many times you've read it. Uh, turning to another domain, the U.S. Treasury Department has a bureau that's assigned the task of investigating suspicious financial transfers. It's a central component of the war on terror. Uh, in April 2004, the Bureau gave its regular report to Congress, and it informed Congress that of its 120 employees, four were assigned to tracking the finances of Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein, while uh, six times that many were occupied with enforcing the embargo against Cuba. Tells you something else about priorities. This goes way back. From 1990 to 2003, there were 93 terrorism-related investigations with $9,000 in fines 
and 11,000 Cuba-related investigations with $8 million in fines. The revelations, of course, received the silent treatment in the U.S. media and elsewhere as well, to my knowledge. Uh, well, why should the Treasury Department devote vastly more energy to strangling Cuba than to the war on terror? Uh, well, the basic reasons were explained in internal documents of the Kennedy-Johnson years. Uh, State Department planners warned that, in their words, the very existence of the Castro regime is successful defiance of U.S. policies going back 150 years to the Monroe Doctrine. Notice, not Russians, but intolerable defiance of the master of the hemisphere. Uh, much like Iran's crime of successful defiance in 1979. Uh, punishment of the population of Cuba was regarded as fully legitimate, so we also learn from internal documents. The Eisenhower State Department uh, concluded, decided that in their words, the Cuban people are responsible for the regime, so therefore the United States has the right to cause them to suffer by economic strangulation, uh, later escalated to direct and very serious terror by Kennedy. Uh, Eisenhower and Kennedy agreed that the embargo would hasten Fidel Castro's departure as a result of what they called rising discomfort among hungry Cubans. And notice that all of that fits to a T, the definition of terror quite apart from the direct terrorist acts which were serious. Uh, and so it continued. When Cuba was in dire straits after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Washington intensified the punishment of the people of Cuba uh, at the initiative of liberal Democrats. The author of the 1992 resolution to tighten the blockade proclaimed that my objective is to wreak havoc in Cuba. That's uh, New Jersey liberal Democrat Robert Torricelli. And all of that continues to the present moment putting the war on terror very deep in the shadows because it's much less important than this. Uh, if uh, reducing the threat of terror were a high priority for Washington or London, uh, there would be ways to proceed, uh, even apart from the unmentionable idea of withdrawing participation. Uh, the first step, plainly, is to try to understand its roots. Uh, with regard to Islamic terror, there's a broad consensus among intelligence agencies and researchers. They identify two categories. On the one hand are the jihadis, organized by the U.S. and its allies in the 1980s. Uh, they regard themselves as a vanguard. It's one category. The other category is their audience, which may reject terror, but nevertheless regard the cause of the jihadis as just. So a serious counter-terror campaign it would therefore begin by considering the grievances and, where appropriate, uh, addressing them, as should be done with or without the threat of terror. Some experience in Ireland about this. Uh, there's broad agreement uh, among specialists that Al-Qaeda-style terror, I'm quoting, is today less a product of Islamic fundamentalism than a simple strategic goal to compel the United States and its Western allies to withdraw combat forces from the Arabian Peninsula and other Muslim countries. That's Robert Pape, who's the academic uh, scholar who's done the major uh, studies of uh, suicide bombers. Uh, serious analysts have pointed out that bin Laden's words and deeds correlate closely, and history reveals the same. The jihadis who were organized by the Reagan administration and its allies uh, ended their Afghan-based terror inside Russia uh, after the Russians withdrew from Afghanistan, though they continue it from uh, occupied Muslim Chechnya, which is the scene of uh, horrifying Russian crimes back to the 19th century. Uh, Osama himself turned against the United States in 1991 because he took it to be occupying the holiest Arab land that was later acknowledged by the Pentagon as a reason for shifting U.S. bases from Saudi Arabia to Iraq. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, Osama was angered by the rejection of his offer to join the attack against Saddam. 
uh, the most uh, extensive scholarly inquiry into the jihadi phenomenon by the American scholar Fawaz Girgis uh, concludes that after 9-11, I'm quoting him, the dominant response to al-Qaeda in the Muslim world was very hostile, uh, specifically among the jihadis who regarded it as an extremely dangerous extremist fringe. Uh, instead of recognizing that opposition to al-Qaeda, uh, instead of recognizing that the, the existence of the opposition and the fact that it offered Washington the most effective way to drive a nail into its coffin by finding intelligent means to nourish and support the internal forces that were opposed to militant ideologies like the bin Laden network, uh, the Bush administration did exactly what bin Laden hoped it would do, resort to violence, uh, particularly in the invasion of Iraq. Uh, investigations by Israeli and uh, Saudi intelligence, which are supported by U.S. Strategic Studies Institutes, conclude that foreign fighters in Iraq, which are maybe 5 to 10 percent of the insurgents, were mobilized by the invasion and furthermore had no previous record of association with terrorist groups. Uh, the achievements of the Bush administration planners and its pillion rider uh, their achievements in inspiring Islamic radicalism and terror and in joining Osama in creating a clash of civilizations are quite impressive. Uh, the uh, senior CIA analyst responsible for tracking Osama bin Laden from 1996, Michael Scheuer, writes that U.S. forces and policies are completing the radicalization of the Islamic world something Osama bin Laden has been trying to do with substantial but incomplete success since the early 1990s. As a result, Scheuer adds, it is fair to conclude that the United States of America remains bin Laden's only indispensable ally. Uh, the grievances that the jihadis appeal to as a mobilizing technique, those are very real. Uh, a Pentagon Advisory Board panel just a few months ago concluded a, uh, that uh, Muslims do not hate our freedom, but rather they hate our policies. Uh, and they added that when American public diplomacy talks about bringing democracy to Islamic societies, uh, this is seen as no more than self-serving hypocrisy. Uh, those conclusions go back many years uh, if we choose not to know them, it's because of intentional ignorance. They've been public for a long time. Uh, the uh, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower in 1958, puzzled about what he called the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world, not by the governments, but by the people who are on Nasser's side, uh, supporting independent secular nationalism, which the U.S. opposed. It was supporting fundamentalist extremism. Uh, the reason for the campaign of hatred uh, was explained by the National Security Council, the highest planning organization. Uh, here are their words. In the eyes of the majority of Arabs, the United States appears to be opposed to the realization of the goals of Arab nationalism. They believe that the United States is seeking to protect its interest in Near East oil by supporting the status quo and opposing political or economic progress. Uh, furthermore, they say the perception is understandable. Our economic and cultural interests in the area have led not unnaturally to close U.S. relations with elements in the Arab world whose primary interest lies in the maintenance of relations with the West and the status quo in their countries, uh, blocking democracy and development. Uh, they didn't go on to point out that this is the most extreme fundamentalist fanatics in the world and also some of the most brutal and vicious regimes. That's 1958. Uh, right after 9-11, the Wall Street Journal uh, carried out a survey of the opinions of what they called moneyed Muslims. That's immediately after 9-11. Uh, they surveyed the bankers, professionals, uh, businessmen, uh, all committed to official so-called Western values and embedded in the neoliberal globalization project. 
uh, they too were dismayed by Washington's support for harsh authoritarian states and the barriers Washington erects against development and democracy by propping up oppressive regimes. That goes on to the present moment. Uh, they, however, had new grievances beyond those reported by the National Security Council in 1958, uh, primarily Washington's sanctions regime in Iraq, U.S.-British sanctions regime, uh, and support for, uh, uh, didn't mean much in the West, but uh, slaughtering hundreds of thousands of people, uh, devastating the society, strengthening Saddam, probably preventing him from being overthrown. Now, that actually meant something among the backward people of the Arab world. Uh, that was one. And the other was support for uh, Israel's military occupation and takeover of the occupied territories. Uh, there was no survey carried out of the great mass of poor and suffering people, but it's likely that their sentiments are more intense, uh, coupled with bitter resentment of the Western-oriented elites and the corrupt and brutal rulers backed by Western power who ensure that the enormous wealth of the region flows to the West, apart from enriching themselves. And the Iraq invasion only intensified these feelings further, uh, much as anticipated, also contributing materially to the increase in the threat and reality of nuclear proliferation and uh, international terrorism. Uh, well, there are ways to deal constructively with the threat of terror, uh, though not preferred by bin Laden's indispensable ally, uh, or by those who want to avoid the real world by uh, striking heroic poses about Islamo-fascism, or those who simply claim that uh, no proposal has been made when there are quite straightforward proposals that they do not like. The constructive ways begin uh, with an honest look in the mirror, uh, never an easy task, uh, always a necessary one. Thank you. you. You may have to do an encore if you're not careful. Okay. <laughs> We're now going to have our question and answer session. We have some roving mics around there, about four. So when you get the mic, if you just tell us who you are, and please, would you ask a quick question? We don't have much time. And I know that Professor Chomsky will oblige us too with quick answers. But That's I'm, a very I'm, pointed I'm, I'm comment. I'm going to take one, <laughs> one liberty and just throw a very quick one at you before I go to the, uh, to, to the audience. Has there ever been any overseas military invention, intervention by the United States that you've been in favor of over the last 60 or 70 years? Well, you could generalize that question. Has there ever been any military intervention by anybody uh, that was uh, justifiable? There probably are a few, but it's very difficult to find any. Uh, the, there are very thick legal tomes uh, studying humanitarian intervention, and uh, one of the interesting features of them is they cannot find any bona fide examples. Uh, they can find bona fide examples of military interventions that happen to have benign effects, uh, but uh, if you look at them, the results are not terribly uh, attractive to us. Uh, so take, say, Pearl Harbor. Uh, I don't know anyone who goes out on the streets and celebrates Pearl Harbor every, de every December 7th. Uh, the Japanese fascists had been carrying out hideous atrocities in uh, China and Manchuria, and uh, Pearl Harbor and bombing the Philippines and what happened later was other horrible atrocities. But it happened to have benign effects unintended, but it had them. Uh, it drove the white man out of Asia. Uh, that was extremely important. It saved millions of lives, tens of millions. I mean, India alone probably saved tens of millions of lives. After the British were driven out of India, they no longer suffered the horrifying famines that killed tens of millions of people under British rule, and they were able to resume a path of development that had been stopped 200 years earlier. Okay, that's important. No, right. Nobody praises Japanese fascism for that. Or to take the recent period, since the Second World War, there are two major cases of intervention which had substantial benign effects. Uh, one is uh, India's invasion of East Pakistan uh, in, in 1971, 
which did save tens of millions of, millions of lives. Uh, the second was Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia in 1979, uh, which terminated the Pol Pot regime's crimes just at the moment when they were escalating. They were peaking in 1978. This is December 1978. Uh, those are two interventions that did have major benign effects. But those are not listed when we talk about benign humanitarian intervention for obvious reasons, uh, wrong agency. Uh, furthermore, the United States was bitterly opposed to both of them. Uh, it punished India and threatened it with worse uh, for the crime of invading East Pakistan. The main reason in that case was that that spoiled some planned photo ops for Henry Kissinger, who was planning to go through Pakistan to China. Big excitement, but this kind right. of ruined it. Uh, the uh, Vietnam <laughs> invasion was uh, a crime because, uh, and in fact, uh, it was terribly criminal. The U.S. Uh, supported a Chinese invasion of Vietnam to punish them for the crime of terminating Khmer Rouge crimes, and the U.S. and Britain immediately turned to supporting Pol Pot uh, diplomatically and mil militarily. Well, for those reasons, these examples can't be in the canon. Uh, okay. If you look for others, you can maybe find some that had benign effects, but it's not so simple. I urge you to try. Okay, thank you. Um, we will take uh, yes, could we get a microphone here, please? And again, just if you tell us who you are and if you could make your question uh, short, that would be uh, a, 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 a great help. The mic is on its way. It's getting there. It's there. Yes. Thank you. William Shabas, Irish Center for Human Rights in Galway. At last year's lecture, Michael Ignatiev, in a response to a difficult question, said, I'm no Chomsky. If you came looking for Chomsky, you'll be disappointed. Uh, disappointed we were, and it's a pleasure to have the real thing here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> My question is about nuclear weapons. You were cited in this morning's Irish Times talking about the possibility that, that Iran might get nuclear weapons. And I think that it might be a statement that's difficult for some people to understand because of some of the appalling things that the current president of Iran has been saying. What can you tell us about the issue of nuclear weapons and their connection with terrorism? Can we say that those states that stockpile and possess nuclear weapons are themselves committing acts of terrorism? Well, there was a world court decision on that, uh, unanimous in, I think, 1996. Uh, which declared that uh, the states with nuclear weapons are under a legal obligation to observe their commitment in the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1970, Article 6, uh, to, to undertake good faith efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, the, all the nuclear states are in violation of their commitment. The United States far in the lead because it rejects it flatly and explicitly. Uh, there's actually an interesting column today in, t in the British uh, London Financial Times by Zelig Harrison, who's one of the leading specialists on this topic. And, uh, he points out that uh, uh, the U.S., is, that Europe is guilty of almost compelling Iran to develop nuclear weapons because under U.S. influence in its usual cowardly fashion, uh, Europe has refused to implement the bargain that was made with Iran. There was a bargain between the European Union and Iran. You only hear half of it. He quoted the other half. Uh, the bargain was that Iran would not carry out uh, enrichment of uh, fissile materials if Europe would agree to uh, discuss the issues of security for the region. Now, that's a way of referring to the threats of the United States and Israel to bomb Iran. So if, the, if Europe would agree to enter into a discussion of the general security issues, then Iran would uh, uh, stop uh, enriching fissile materials. Well, under U.S. pressure, Europe just backed off. Uh, you haven't read anything about that or probably even seen it. And as he points out, that's uh, almost telling Iran you better uh, develop nuclear weapons as a deterrent. 
And he also points out exactly what you said. He said the refusal of the, and this is what's highlighted in the Financial Times, a uh, separate headline, that the nuclear weapon states are uh, in the most serious violation of the non-proliferation treaty. Technically, Iran's not in any violation of it, but the, non the nuclear states are in violation and are not only refusing to accept it, but in the case of the United States, he didn't go on to say this, in the case of the United States, there are, uh, uh, in fact, uh, increasing the uh, development of nuclear weapons. Should this be called terrorism? It's a little bit like asking whether uh, the invasion of, uh, Nicar you know, the terrorist war in Nicaragua should be called aggression, meaning crime, highest supreme international crime for which people were hanged at Nuremberg. Technically, yes. Uh, technically, this is way beyond terrorism. I mean, remember, okay. development of nuclear weapons means destroying the species, almost inevitably. Okay, this is where it's very useful to wear a very bright jumper. There's a man with a striped jumper here in the front row. Could we get a microphone to him, please? Yes. Yes, uh, Richard Boyd Barrett from the Irish Anti-War Movement. Uh, I'd just like to add my uh, congratulations to Professor Chomsky. It's such a breath of fresh air to hear a bit of the truth about the war on terror compared to what we get in much of the mainstream media. I just have... Two questions, uh, really. Um, you may know that about 300,000 US troops are, have gone through Shannon this year uh, on the way to Iraq, about half a million since the war began. Uh, and about 60, 50 to 60 of the CIA rendition flights have also gone through here, uh, which the Irish government refused to search. Uh, I wonder, would you agree with uh, many people, I think, in this country, and certainly with the anti-war movement, that by, allowing, by the Irish government allowing US troops in those numbers, which have dramatically increased since the war started, going through Shannon en route to Iraq, that they are in fact complicit with terrorism, with war crimes, and with breaches of international human rights. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and secondly, secondly uh, again, you may know that the same international coordination of anti-war organizations that called for the huge demonstrations on February the 15th, 2003, have called for demonstrations on March the 18th and March the 19th, right across the world, calling for an end to the occupation of Iraq. And I wonder, would Professor Chomsky say a word about, certainly what I would see is the vital importance to put the anti-war movement back on the streets again for people to organize against the occupation and okay. against the US okay. terrorist war. Okay, thank you. Se second one is easy to answer, yes. <laughs> it's very important. Uh, and in fact, recall that you're, that means supporting the overwhelming majority of the population of Iraq, as far as we know. Um, they're not taking polls anymore, apparently, because they're coming out the wrong way. But some are being taken and uh, leaked. The British Defense Ministry uh, took a poll last August. It was leaked to the right-wing British press. Uh, it, according to its results, which are confirmed by the Brookings Institute in the United States, uh, over 80% of the population uh, wants the occupying forces out, either immediately or quickly. Uh, the, uh, almost half the population uh, accepts attacks against the occupying forces as legitimate, and uh, a smashing 1% of the population thinks that they bring higher security. Uh, and other evidence tends to support that. Uh, so the demonstration is actually in support of the population of Iraq, as far as we know. On the first question, I can only respond conditionally. I don't know the facts. Uh, I understood the stand. In fact, I just learned at the reception before this meeting that there is a, a, a parliamentary investigation of some sort that's going to be underway to determine the facts about what's going on in Shannon, and I hope it succeeds. But if what you say is correct, and if, in fact, even part of it is correct, uh, yeah, that's participation in uh, uh, what was declared at Nuremberg to be, I'll quote it, the supreme international crime uh, which encompasses within itself all of the evil that follows, all of the evil that follows. Participation in that is, yes, a crime. Uh, that's, uh, and from then on, it's up to it's your business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's, he, he, you're a diplomat as well, I, I, I can see. There's somebody here I'm going to, but there's uh, somebody at the end of the row uh, down here, please, man in, in red, could we get a microphone 
to him. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Professor Chomsky. I'm a media student here in Dublin for some terrible pass-ins. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what do you feel is the, the real reason behind the current American campaign? Is it economical, ego, I don't know, and has it gone to the point where there is no feasible exit strategy? Well, um, we can defer on this question to, as in the case of withdrawal, uh, to the victims. Always makes sense to pay attention to the victims. Uh, there was a poll taken in a Gallup poll, I mean, polling organization in Baghdad, uh, very nicely timed. It was timed right after the president had given a speech uh, declaring his messianic mission to bring democracy to the Iraq and the world and so on. Uh, liberal press uh, hailed it as uh, meant that this was the most noble war in history and on and on. Uh, a couple of days after that, the results of the poll were released in Baghdad. Uh, people were asked what, an open question, why did they think that the United States and Britain invaded Iraq? And uh, there were some who agreed with Western, near unanimous Western opinion that it was to bring democracy and freedom and so on, 1%. Uh, 1% said the United States and Britain invaded to bring democracy. 5% uh, said they invaded to help the Iraqi people. And most of the rest said what ought to be obvious to anyone who's not uh, uh, really deeply uh, enfeebled by, uh, <laughs> by intentional ignorance. Uh, the rest of them said that the purpose of the invasion was to take over the immense resources of Iraq uh, and uh, strengthen the U.S. position, Britain behind it, of domination of the world's energy resources, and to support Israel's objectives secondarily. I mean, that can't fail to be true. We're not allowed to say it. It's under a ban. You're not allowed to say that. It's called a conspiracy theory or Marxist or some other bad name. But uh, what it is is just elementary common sense. I mean, we shouldn't even be talking about it. Uh, so, yes, that's the reason. Uh, now, getting back to... Uh, uh, getting back to exit strategies, the fact that we are so, the West is so disciplined that nobody virtually can mention the obvious truth entails that almost all the discussion of exit strategies is beside the point, literally, uh, almost, almost all of it. Because you can't talk about exit strategy. I mean, you, you know, the Pentagon can figure out how to get the troops out. They don't need our advice. Uh, the, uh, uh, you can't talk seriously about exit strategies until you answer the question why the United States and Britain are determined not to leave. Okay, for the United States and Britain to uh, permit a sovereign and moderately democratic Iraq would be a nightmare for them. And it just takes a few minutes to think it through. Uh, what would be the policies of a sovereign and moderately democratic Iraq? Well, have a Shiite majority, okay? Uh, the Shiite majority would much prefer to have friendly relations with their powerful Shiite neighbor, Iran, than hostile relations. In fact, there already are close relations. A uh, large majority of the clerics in the South are either from Ira Iran, like the Ayatollah Sistani, or have close relations with them. The militias, the major militia that's... Uh, running much of the South, Badr militia, was trained in Iran. Uh, and the connections remain very close. In fact, they're already reestablishing them. Uh, the US and Britain call that Iranian interference in Iraqi affairs, which is horrifying. How could a foreign country dare to interfere in Iraq's affairs? You know, horrors. Uh, but uh, uh, it's likely that those uh, relations would increase. Uh, if that's as if that were not bad enough, uh, right across the border in Saudi Arabia, uh, there happens to be a region where there's a Shiite majority uh, that's been bitterly oppressed by the U.S.-backed fundamentalist tyranny, and they've tried occasionally to get some kind of voice, uh, but they're being, uh, you know, the, the, just the limited degree of sovereignty that already ex the Iraqis have won for themselves is already stimulating resistance there, and that'll increase. So uh, would it be better we, all in all if Saddam well, was second. still there? Wait a second. Uh, there's another point. That happens to be where Saudi oil is, most, most of it. 
Okay, just think what this means from the point of view of US and British planners. It means a potential Shiite alliance that controls most of the world's oil and is out of the control of the United States and Britain. Okay, and will probably turn towards the east. Uh, they've probably given up. Iran has probably given up by now on European cowardice and may very well turn to China, which isn't intimidated by the United States, unlike Europe. That's why there's so much fear of China. And they're already starting to do that. And China's beginning to invest in not only Iran, but even in Saudi Arabia. I mean, you can't imagine a worse nightmare for Washington and London. It's like the end of the world. That's why they can't simply withdraw, and they only will if there's very powerful pressure inside the United States and Britain, elsewhere in Europe, to compel them to do this. But the anti-war movement can't face this fact unless it's willing to recognize the elementary truths that we are not allowed to think about because we are under doctrinal control so rigid that they probably couldn't achieve it in North Korea. You know, that's literally the case. I mean, these are the most elementary facts about exit strategies. Have you seen them discussed? Well, actually, you know, a few places, but uh, very little. So, so, so what about the unthinkable thought? Would it be better if Saddam was still there? It's better for who? Not for Iraqis. But if you're asking about Washington and London, yeah, that's, that's actually why they supported them in 1991. I mean, in 1991, remember, after the first war, the U.S. and Britain had total control of the area. I mean, it's yeah. overwhelming. There was a Shiite rebellion in the South including rebelling Iraqi generals. They didn't ask for help. They just asked for the US not to permit Saddam Hussein to destroy them. Uh, they, they asked for access to captured Iraqi equipment. The US and Britain refused. They authorized Saddam Hussein to use uh, military aircraft to attack them. Uh, later they claimed they'd been hoodwinked. They didn't realize that he was actually going to use the uh, bombers when they authorized it. Uh, yeah, so there was a brutal massacre, and the reasons are exactly what I said. Uh, Thomas Friedman, the diplomatic correspondent, chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times, wrote after this uh, that uh, he said the best of all worlds for the United States would be an iron-fisted military junta ruling Iraq the same way Iraq Saddam did, but not Saddam. That's embarrassing now. Uh, okay. But since the U.S. couldn't get the best of all worlds, had to get the second best. Okay, can we take a question? There's a woman here in the middle row. Can you just wait, please, until we get a microphone to you? No, there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Esther Carter, Westmeath section of the Irish anti-war movement. I'd like to ask Noam, uh, can he uh, expand at all on the uh, Salvador, so-called Salvador option that Negroponte has taken up in uh, Iraq? with the death squads and state terrorism uh, that we understand is going on there. Um, well, perhaps he could. Salvador option okay. has two meanings. One is the reality and the other is the image. Uh, the reality is uh, the fact that El Salvador, uh, under the, in the first phase of the war on terror, the one in the 1980s, uh, was uh, subjected to massive state terrorism Maybe 70,000 people slaughtered, uh, brutal torture, hundreds of thousands of refugees. Uh, almost all the atrocities are attributed to the state security forces. There was an independent truth commission afterwards, all supported by the United States. Uh, you may recall that the decade opened with the assassination of an archbishop while he was uh, uh, reading mass. Uh, voice for the voiceless, he was called. The, de the decade ended with uh, the murder of six leading Jesuit intellectuals, Latin American intellectuals, Jesuit priests had their brains blown out by an elite US-run uh, battalion, which had already killed thousands of people, led a bloody trail of massacre, and in between, another 70,000 people slaughtered, priests, nuns, human rights activists, uh, mostly peasants, the usual victims. And if anything remotely like this had happened, say, in Czechoslovakia, now, we'd probably have had a nuclear war. You know, certainly everybody would be screaming their heads off about it. But since we did it, it didn't exist. Okay, that's the Salvador option. Uh, there's another story, which is that uh, the Salvador option led to democratic elections. Well, take a look at those elections and see what it was. 
Uh, so the, and there's another point to be made about El Salvador and uh, uh, Iraq, which is rarely discussed. Uh, the second largest military force in Iraq after the United States is not Britain, it's US mercenaries. Uh, some of them are called contractors, some are called something else, and a large percentage of them are Salvadorans. Uh, after the massacres of the 80s, they were kind of out of a job, you know. Uh, so they, uh, uh, like South African mercenaries who were all over the place, kind of out of a job after apartheid was over, and they were being recruited in a kind of a foreign legion. Uh, remember that the imperial, the real imperial, the old imperial powers, Britain, France, others, uh, they didn't use troops, many troops, to f hold down the colonies. They used mercenaries, you know, Gurkhas, you know, foreign legion, and so on. Uh, the, uh, the, the United States made a mistake in Vietnam. It tried to use a civilian army to fight a colonial war. Uh, it didn't work. You need trained killers. Uh, it fell apart, the army, to its credit. Uh, now they're turning to high-tech war, and which you don't need a lot of ground troops, and to mercenaries. Uh, the, what's called a volunteer army in the United States is actually a mercenary army. It's a mercenary army of the disadvantaged. Uh, people join it because it's the only way to escape what they have to live with. Uh, and yeah, then you can train into trained killers. Or the best of all are people like Salvadoran murderers who were trained by the United States to slaughter their own populations, now need a, another job. Uh, so that's another part of the Salvador option. And it is the beginning of, uh, along with South Africans and some others, of uh, actually British intelligence cooperates in this and others, of a kind of a mercenary force that uh, might be an appropriate foreign legion for uh, colonial wars. Okay, there's a man trying to get in desperately up here on the right. Never let it be said that amnesty doesn't bring people in from the margins. So could we please get either a microphone to him or him to a microphone? Yeah, good. Look, Claire, I still have the use of my legs. Yeah. Um, this is a question from the cheap seats. Um, <laughs> somebody gave me a ticket outside and let me in. I didn't have a ticket. Um, and uh, Olivia, we have to keep a queue going. You can't jump in. Everybody else wants to ask a question, so it's not questions and answers. Let the public in. Okay. My name's Dermo. And uh, I, I was only trying asked to, one and a half. I know, That's I know, I know. Yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm, just, very good. I'm just, you know, I'm speaking for yeah, the rest I won't, of the, I won't for be the greedy. people here. For the people. I won't be greedy, okay. Okay, and the, uh, the question I have, um, there was a beautiful quote. I was standing outside a gate here tonight. I was trying to give out a free paper, which was an anarchist paper, right? Lots of people laughed at me and said, what's that got to do with Noam Chomsky? And uh, they walked on past, but they wouldn't read it, okay? Mm -hmm. Given that there's an absolute lack of uh, this kind of information in any um, channels, and you use that beautiful quote, um, international ignorance, I think, widely... Intentional ignorance. Oh, sorry, intentional, yeah. Mm. I'm misquoting you already. Um, in, <laughs> intentional... And you're not even in the media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so intentional ignorance and a widely distributed plague amongst the intelligence. I think tonight we have a, a remarkably intelligent audience. And I think that... One of the things, one of the reasons why we stand outside and we give out papers is because we want people to get involved. And I think if everybody in this room, instead of marching up and down O'Connell Street and telling the government that they're annoyed with the war, if we all went down to Shannon and tore down the fence, it would then become pretty bloody obvious, unmanageable to people. So, no, this is a very long-winded, long-winded question. My question to you is, would you join hands with me and say that you're an anti-capitalist and that all the issues that we fight today are actually byproducts of capitalism and that's the only way we're ever going to solve the problem because this could be your last tour you know so you may as well <laughs> get it out there <laughs> well um, thanks very much it's not a secret i mean but it's a little more nuanced than that first of all nothing remotely like capitalism exists uh, what's called capitalism is a certain variety of state capitalism uh, the irish miracle that everyone's so happy about uh, has very little to do with neoliberal economics it primarily relies on the dynamic state sector of the U.S. economy. Uh, that's where all the high uh, information technology comes from and so on. So we're not even talking about capitalism. Uh, there are many evils in the world. You can't identify one of them. But uh, one of the insights, deep insights of the anarchist tradition is that all hierarchic structures, whatever they are, any structure of domination and hierarchy uh, should be challenged. None of it is self-justifying. Uh, 
it has to be challenged, and, it has, and the burden of proof lies on any supporter of hierarchy and domination, wherever it is, from the family of international affairs. Anyone who supports it has a burden of proof. They have to show that it's legitimate. If they can't show that it's legitimate, it should be dismantled. Uh, sometimes you can show it's dis uh, legitimate. So if I'm walking down the street with my three-year-old granddaughter, and she runs out into the street, and I grab her hand and pull her back, now that's authority. But I think there's a justification for it. But unless you can give some kind of a justification, it ought to be dismantled. Now that includes state capitalism and lots of other evils in the world. OK, there's somebody in the, in the, um, there's somebody in the cheap seats at the back, and I want to let them in. It's only fair to move around the hall as widely as I can. Could you come down to the microphone here? Can we get a microphone? Uh, to, to that person. I just want to range as wide as I can. Yeah. Hello, I'll be brief. My name is Michael Shea. I'm just a citizen. Um, I'm sure we'd all here like to see, above all, a better balanced world. Let's, uh, less of a, an empire trying to establish itself and brook, brooking no resistance. That's to say the US. Um, so much of that is uh, its ability to seemingly limitlessly fund military spending. And if we weren't in the world required to both buy and sell oil in dollars, if there was some other currency, maybe a euro of 30 countries, would that help to curb that spending and, as I say, maybe be ending up with a better balanced world? Well, it's likely that sooner or later the world, the many major powers, East Asia in particular, Northeast Asia, are going to shift to some kind of basket of currencies. Uh, they hold huge financial reserves. I mean, I think more than half of foreign exchange, some number like that, uh, of reserves are in Northeast Asia, mostly in Japan, secondarily China, South Korea, India, and so on. Uh, they're, they're willing to support the dollar. They like to keep the dollar high, for one thing, because that maintains their export markets. Uh, but they lose by it in other respects, and sooner or later they'll change. No economist knows when, but everyone expects it, as long as the huge trade deficit exists and so on. What would be the, and then it will include the, uh, uh, the dollar basis for, the, uh, for oil, which is a kind of a compact between the uh, tyrannies that the U.S. and Britain support to run the oil states. Uh, they're they have a compact with the West, uh, their job is to make sure that the wealth of the region flows to the West, not to the people of the region, and of course to themselves. You know, they have a big rake off. Uh, but how long they can maintain that is you know, it's not so clear. I mean, there have been democratizing forces in the Arab world for years. They've been crushed by the imperial powers. It's true of Iraq as well. But you can't crush them forever. You know, so sooner or later something may happen. Uh, and yes, these things might what you described might turn out to be the case. I don't think anybody can tell you what the consequences of that are. I mean, it would be a terrific shock to the international economic system and just what it would mean, nobody knows, nor does it, do we know how the powerful states, primarily the US, would react to it. I mean, they have incredible means of violence in their, at their disposal, and the only thing that can stop them is their own citizens. So we're back to ourselves again. You've got to be prepared for those things and undermine the aggressive militarism that lies behind all of this. It's as good a note to end on as any. We've passed our half-eight mark, everybody. I'm really sorry. And now, in order to thank our guest for this evening, I think you could all agree he's been extraordinarily generous with his time. To thank him, I want to call on Sean Love, Director of Amnesty International Irish Section. Sean. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, I should just say that it's a little over three years since I actually contacted Noam and asked him to come and speak at our annual lecture. And with the, what I've since discovered is the typical accessibility and generosity, he was back within minutes by email saying, yes, I would love to, and I'll do my best to schedule it. 
it gives you an idea of the demand on his time. The very first slot in his schedule was now. And he has, he lived up to the commitment. I'd also like to say that the person in Amnesty International who suggested that we ask Noam was a very beloved colleague of ours, uh, Frank Jennings. And um, Frank died just before Christmas after a long illness. And uh, it would have been tremendous had he and he wanted to, to survive uh, until uh, this lecture tonight. But from Amnesty, we want to, to dedicate tonight, particularly to the memory of Frank Jennings. I'm just, I, have, I really have to do a few very quick thank yous um, to Trinity College uh, for their, their annual support to us for this event and for their generosity of heart in helping us so positively to move the whole venue to here um, to try to bring in as big a crowd as possible when we realize the demand to hear Noam speak. And also to the RDS and to the people who put together the Young Scientists setup, which is where you're sitting now. Um, within the next four or five hours, this place will be an empty box. And all of these people put, had left this in place at a, a lot of uh, difficulty for themselves with great generosity. And um, we're, we're very grateful to them for doing that and for such an excellent venue. I obviously want to thank Olivia as well for her now annual uh, great chairing and to thank all of you for, for coming. Um, I think it's been a great night. No amnesty speeches. I think that you, you were all given one of these leaflets as you came in. If you want to take action with amnesty on uh, addressing the so-called war on terror, addressing issues of torture as they, they re-enter international vocabulary, vocabulary and use, the website of Amnesty Irish section is on the back of this. Just go to the website. You can take action at any level you like. So my final thank you is obviously to, to Carol and Noam Chomsky for their... Carol's in the front. She's very quiet there, but um, they come as a team. And uh, we are massively, massively grateful to them for their time. And on behalf of all of you, I would like to thank them very much. And while they're here and get the ask in for you to come back soon, please.